what's going on? It's the NOC, the Nerds of Color. I am Kuya P, aka Patrick Michael Strange, and I am back with another knock exclusive interview for today. I have a very special one going on right now. I have fam in the house. Not, you know, not to say anything bad about some of the other cats I've brought on, but when it's family, you know, it's a little bit more special. And so I want to show you to my left or my right. She's on the screen right now. Please meet Adeline. How are you, girl? Hi, I'm great. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining me. Let's get these people hip to you for those that aren't initiated. I, I don't know why they aren't initiated, but they should <laughs> definitely be initiated. See what's up because I am blasting all your tracks daily. You know what I'm saying? Not just because you're fam. It's because they hitting, they lit. So uh -huh. let's get all the people lit right now. Let's throw to some tracks and then we'll get into uh, my conversation with Miss Adeline. Here we go. So quickly Caught up in a purple haze Floating as I ride the wave
I know you want to head over to iTunes and Spotify, all the streaming services to cop all of her tracks, all those albums. But please hold up. Just give me just give me a sec. Just give me a couple minutes of your time so you can meet and learn all about who you're going to be riding with in your car now. Miss Adeline, how are you, girl? Again, miss you. Love you. Um, love before you we too. get into an icebreaker, how are you holding it down, staying creative during this COVID time right now? You know what? I, I have to say, um, I, I'm generally the kind of personality that looks at, tries to look at the bright side. Um, but in full honesty, this has been a good year for me. It's, it's very challenging. Of course, I feel like it's more challenging for other people. You know, we're always should look at what the, the good side is. Um, and it, musically, it's been going well. You know, being uh, forced to stay inside is kind of um, what my life was already. And I actually... <laughs> I guess the, in short, I did not realize I had been living in quarantine my whole life because just being in the studio indoors for hours all day long is what I was doing already. So there you go. That's no lie. That's no lie. All right. So let's take it back to beautiful Fran France, France. However, you know, I'm American. So, you know, I'm going to say France, France. I, 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 you know, I know you, you can say it much more elegant than I can. Um, but let's you you said it right. Okay. Have you've you. been there. Yes, many a time. Um, let's talk about uh, your parents. Let's talk about them, how they met, fell in love, and then you came into the picture. Let's take it way back before you even were, were a seed. Whoa, yeah. What did your parents do? Um, what were they into? Were they musically inclined? Anything like that? Well, my, my parents are from two very, very different places. Um, a little bit something that you can relate to, I'm sure, being you yeah. know of <laughs> background. And my father is from the Caribbean island of Martinique, which is closer to the United States actually than than it is to France. But uh, it is a French territory, so if you're born there, you're automatically a French citizen. Um, and he moved to France at 18. Um, he grew up in a very poor family, and the only way to kind of to actually go to school and go to college, get an education was to enroll in the military. So he left, uh, he has a family of, he's a, one of 10. So he left his nine brothers and sisters. I think he probably still had another sibling on the way by the time he left France. But uh, anyways, and uh, my mother is from the countryside in France in the Southwest of France, uh, raised one of 11. So I've come from very, very, 
very populated territories. Um, and she's the last one of 11. My grandparents were farmers and uh, the place where my mom is from, which is in the Southwest of France, my mother's family has been living in the house. Uh, we can retrace back to 1715. Wow. So you know, old, old, old stuff. So they're, they're truly like country French people. They even speak another language, they speak a dialect. So both my parents are like French, but speak their own dialects, have crazy accents and have different kinds of food. Um, and yeah, they met, they had, a, I have two older brothers and sisters from a different mother. And then uh, my older brother uh, right before me and then myself. And uh, in terms of music, musicality, I think it first comes from my father's culture, being from the Caribbean. It's, you know, music is part of our identity and culture, much more so than it, in comparison to my mom's culture, for instance. I'm very close to that culture and yeah. farming and, or, and, you know, food and um, joy of living, joie de vivre, like we would say in France. Uh, but but when it comes to music, um, it, it definitely comes from my father's side. Everybody plays an instrument or sings or dances, and that's how we express ourselves. And then I, I come that. from a family of uh, four siblings, so it's four of us. And we all sing and play instruments. And being the youngest one, of course, I took after the other ones and all the older ones. And my brother, who's six years older in age, um, was in a choir since I was little. And uh, I joined the choir when I was five years old. Awesome. So five years old is when it all started joining this choir for you. Yeah, professionally. Yeah. But wow. before that, I couldn't even tell you when it started because everything that I remember, I was singing. I, there was yeah. music. Uh, I think it started even with my, because my older brother, who's 17 years older than me, uh -huh. uh, plays guitar and sings. So he was in the house playing guitar, playing his music really loud. Everybody had their four siblings and we each had our own musical world in our bedrooms so mm -hmm. our bedrooms were like it was a concert there were different concerts going at the same time <laughs> that's amazing so yeah, did you funny. love it um initially or did you just feel like it was because you like you said it was professional so you know as a kid you know did you want to go and play or were you like did they have to drag you to perform or practice or rehearse or anything like that or you were all about it you were like you were in love with it because it was what the family did so much i loved it so much okay. and i think i'm so thankful for being introduced to that notion that um you can spend your time doing something that you love you know as a kid but also knowing that it's it's somebody does that for a living um but yeah, I absolutely loved it. I was obsessed, completely obsessed with music. Okay. So then you, you fell in love with it. Then who are some of the, uh, beyond, I'm sure you're, you being a fan of your family, you know what I'm saying? Seeing them perform, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, to me, it's that immediate people that would inspire yeah. me. So I'm sure it was the same for you. Um, but outside of that, when you were turning on the TV or listening to the radio, uh, who are some of your early influences that you really enjoyed? I would say the first musical, um, the first musical memories for me are music from the from Martinique, from my dad's island. Nice. Um, and because we have these like really crazy elaborate family reunions, and it's always <laughs> revolves around dancing and singing, and everybody's dancing. On I mean, we literally have a a course, a meal that's a traditional thing for like a 6 a.m. breakfast from partying all night long. And this is like includes children. Like we literally, they will have us like up all night dancing. So I love it. I love <laughs> it's insane. It. Caribbean people. <laughs> um, so that, that, these are my first memories of music. And my father was, a, my, both my parents were huge Bob Marley fans too. Okay. Um, and then my first, I think my first idol was Mariah Carey. Okay. Mariah. I was like eight years old. I think, and I heard Hero, I think it had been out already, but like that was really um, huge for me, like uh, learning that song. And uh, so I was into the divas at first. It was like, it was Mariah and Celine and like anybody who would like sing high notes. And I knew it was okay. a soprano, I wanted to sing high. Uh, so these were, and Whitney Houston, of course. Yeah. Uh, these were my first like heroes. Okay. So also at that early on stages beyond singing, I know you play the bass guitar. Did you, when did you get into playing the guitar or what was the, what was the first instrument you started learning how to play? Beyond the voice, because this is an yeah, instrument. Yeah, the oh. voice is my first instrument for exactly. sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, 
but but I have to say honestly, I I wasn't a musician until way later. Okay, uh, and that's something that I try to emphasize on when when talking to singers. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not because you're a singer that we don't consider you a musician, but you can make yourself a musician as totally. a, as a singer, and it's important to learn your theory and know what you're doing. Um, anyways, but I I started playing piano when I was really little, like I don't know nine. My stepdad taught me some, um, and then I didn't really continue just because my my schedule was so busy because I was I was in the choir. We did musical and singing and dancing, and I was basically all of my time off. And I was also a gen I was a busy kid, right? Yeah. Um, and then I started when I was a teenager. I, I picked up the guitar. My brother um, bought me my first guitar. It was like a little moment for us. Nice. And I taught myself some chords because I started writing some songs. I was about 16, 17. And um, I had a friend. And just like you said, so right. You said it so right. I had a friend. It's about the people that are close to you and what they do. And because that exposes you to what's possible. Right. And I had this friend, um, Hélène, who's like this really talented girl who played guitar so well and sang songs. And I was like, oh, my God, I, if she can do that, I can probably try and do that. Yeah. So I, I got a guitar, started writing. Um, and then after, only after I moved to New York, I accidentally started playing bass. I was in a, my first, so fast forward years later, and, uh, I have my first group when I first moved to New York, it was called the crowd, me and two guys. And it was like hip hop soul. Um, and we all played instruments and I played guitar and we had a show. We had, we hired a bass player and a drummer. The bass player canceled the show at the last minute. And in rehearsal, the guys were like, well, Adeline, you play guitar. Why don't you just play bass? And they put a bass in my hand. And it's like I was born again that day. My wow. life completely changed. That's dope. That's real dope. I want to tackle that in a bit. Um, I want to, because you had mentioned, you know, writing uh, initially in high school. And yeah. now you're an amazing writer now. But just those first few songs, how was that writing your first song? Um, what was that first song about? You know, let's, let's go back to just, you know, rekindle some of those memories. So the first song, I think there's two that I remember specifically, but they've had two chords. <laughs> I learned, you know, chords and most of the time it's like open E major, you know, like minor, <laughs> I, E minor or something. Yeah. Uh, so there were two chords and it, it, they were in French. Uh, and I think the first one was about, it's so crazy because I, I feel like I'm thinking back on it and it was pretty mature and it, it's not necessarily, <laughs> it just makes you realize that like love is, is really a feeling and it doesn't evolve. Like the way we love at like 15 or like even 10 years old, it's so deep and so real. <laughs> yeah, and, Or at least we think it is. Or we, we don't really know is. yet. Exactly. It's just, <laughs> just a different kind of love, I guess. But I was like 16 or 17. I wrote about this guy that I like, I, and the song was about how I realized that I thought he was some like who I, and, and it's such a girl thing to do. Like to, you take basically this blank canvas of this random guy. And it's like, he's the one. And you imagine you put all these attributes to this person and th they're not real. Um, so that's what the song was about is how I just basically crafted this, this personality out of this guy who actually turned out to not be that at all. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> so true. I love it. Oh man. Um, so you, you, you're making your first songs and, and when did you know that this was what you wanted to do outside of it already semi being a profession? Um, but like your, your life, your life goal to now do this. And before you headed off, you know, to come to New York. To, which I was reading some of your other uh, interviews and bios uh, that, you know, you it was kind of like a fluke trip in a way or a, an exploratory trip. So uh, how is it that realization that this is what you wanted to do and then approaching your parents about that um, prior to leaving to come here on that exploratory trip? So I think for that, we have to like roll back to back to childhood. Okay. And I, I always knew okay okay honestly i always yeah. knew what i wanted to do i always knew who i was meant to be and Love supposed it. to do. so i yeah ever since i was a little girl i would have described the life that i'm living today i thought it was going to be a big star at 22 that didn't happen uh -huh. uh, but but it's it's really i'm living my dream so your parents were, were they they never stopped the encouragement they're always with you on that there was no struggle yeah, in that I mean, respect. 
you know, it, it, there, it is, there is something to say about the teenage years and going through that phase and yeah. uh, like everything is uncertain. And, you, you know, um, I had this fierce confidence between like the time I was born until I was about like 14. Okay. And then at 14, I just doubted myself. I did. I, that, these are probably the only two years where like, I just, that dream was quiet in my mind and I was embarrassed to talk about it at that point. Um, but before that, my father in particular was always very push. I mean, not, he never pushed me, but he always said the most encouraging things at the right time. And just kind of always, his motto is cool. You did good. You can do better. You have to be the best. You have to do great. Okay. Uh, so I grew up with that in mind, knowing that like, okay, you did that. Now you can do better. You can do better. Um, and that, 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 that's how I, I found the encouragement. It wasn't really like my parents were not like managers or momagers or anything like that. I was very much on my own growing up okay. uh, for various reasons, um, but it worked out. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so the decision comes to take this exploratory trip. How did this decision come into play? Why New York? Why not maybe off to Paris already in country or some other place in Europe or LA? Why the West Coast? Why? Uh, the, the States. Uh, so I was in Paris already because um, I okay. grew up in Paris. I grew up in the hood, though. I was right outside of the city and I grew up in the projects. And OK, uh, actually, a lot of rappers and athletes came out of where I grew up. OK, Something I was there. a huge fan of MC Solar back in the day. Yeah. You remember yeah. him? He, yeah, he was big, but he was he was the he was the um, he was the uh, the non uh, non hood rapper. <laughs> oh, I got you. See, <laughs> Which this, this, this was ninety five, ninety six when I yeah, was in the MCCR. I, I mean, long I time ago. It. I'm an I old guy. <laughs> the, but people in the project didn't really uh, uh, associate with him so much. Like, they're, gotcha. I'll send you some names of bands like NTM. Okay. Is uh, <laughs> one of the biggest. There were two big hip hop groups. It was like the West. It's like in the U.S. You have the West Coast and the East Coast. Yeah. Well, we had Paris and Marseille. Okay. Uh, and I grew up between Paris and Marseille because my dad moved to Marseille when I was eight. Right. Uh, and the big, big hip hop band in Marseille was I Am. And then in Paris was NTM. And NTM were from down the street from me. Like literally, oh. I'm from like the worst place you can imagine in France. Anyways, so I went to college. I, I started, so when I started writing songs around 17, I was also like joined a new choir in the city. And I was... Um, doing a lot of showcases, little shows here and there, trying to sing my songs, singing covers, the neo soul, you know, times in, in, in Paris, all these like kids of immigrants that want to be black Americans <laughs> and, and sing American music. And I started doing some gigs as a background singer too. And I, that's when I was like, out of those teenage um, doubt years, starting to really reapproach, like, no, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I graduated high school, went to college for a year. In the middle of that year, I was like, I am just wasting my time here as a, with the plan B. Yeah. And I remember that specific day where like, this is how 18 year olds think. Um, I was sitting in the amphitheater in class. I was studying like foreign business, whatever, English and Spanish. And I was like, this is boring. I don't want to do this. I want to be a singer, so let's let's just do some math here. And this is me writing notes instead of writing down what the teacher is talking about. I'm like making my stupid notes, and I'm like, well, okay, if I have a plan A and plan B, that means like plan A is music, but then plan B is like this whatever. But like that means I have fifty percent chances of making it music and fifty percent chances of doing something else. Yeah. But what if I take out plan B? Then I'm left with one hundred percent chances if I don't try something else. Uh, and then I left and never went back to school wow. and um, bought a ticket to New York because I had just met some friends from New York who were like working in the business and were like, you're so talented, you should move. And I, I got that particular American encouragement that only exists in America, not really in Europe like that. Like, you can be whatever you want. You can do this. Yeah. Uh, and that was put in my ear at the right time. And I bought a ticket to New York City. Wow. So you're here, you're doing it in NY. What well, were some of these, what were some of the first steps? Because it, it seemed like once you got here from checking out, you know, again, some past interviews, like you got, like, how did the CeeLo stuff happen? A, a score happened. You, and even before that, you said the crowd, your, your first group, how, mm -hmm. how did all these balls get rolling? Because it just seemed like 
like it was a, 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 a when you have snow and you have like a cast snowball effect yeah it just snowballed exactly it really was and i can really honestly retrace back to that one person i met when i was in paris who was from new york to lead me to meet this person to this person to this person and that's why it's important for people that um to just be patient and yes. know that whatever wherever you are right now leads you to the next thing as long as you're looking at what's next you're looking for what's next um and and uh, yeah i i got there i guess the first my friend boris who's like my big brother and uh, pretty much adopted me when I came to New York. He's also an immigrant from France and we met, we were introduced and I was going to stay with him, had never met him. And he was like, who is this little girl? Like, I got to protect her. Yeah. He spoke to my dad on the phone. He was like, don't worry, I got you. It was so sweet. Oh, um, and he knew a lot of people. He was pretty tapped into the nightlife scene in New York. And it, whoever he knew that made music introduced me to. And then from those people, I met other people and other people. And my first, uh, about a year to two years later, I started this band called The Crowd. Uh, and then I uh, was for, you know, then it led me to escort. I mean, I don't know. I could, I, that could be- not escort, way. escort, but the group escort. Yes, I did not become an escort. <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> Time, times are rough though times are hard <laughs> hey yeah. you know i can't i have you know what we all have people that do different types of jobs as long as you're happy and living your life that's what i'm all about i'm gonna support <laughs> you in whatever makes you happy so much love yeah, to, that, if that's that what would, you're doing handle your business get them ducats secure <laughs> that bag you know yep. all love <laughs> So but yeah, go ahead if you have more precise questions, because I feel like I could go on and on about like what. Oh, no worries. To... I'm a setup cat. I, you know, when I do my interviews, I want you to tell your story. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. so the crowd then became escort. And, and, uh, no, and yeah, so the crowd. And then um, I was working as a bartender in okay. uh, this doing side bartending gigs, but mainly singing, doing yeah. all these singing gigs that I could. And the crowd and I were performing at this place called New Blue a lot and i started singing with another band there called the real life show who are just these really talented cats who had like some of the most talented musicians playing their band every week uh, and i met so many people that way and um and then one day one of the guys from that band was like hey my friend has a disco band called escort and he's looking for a singer and that's how I started with singing with Escort. And I wasn't really familiar with the disco, new disco world like that. And being a new bass player, I was like getting really nerdy with all these like old funk disco records because that's yeah. what you learn first. Yeah. If you're not in a rock world and you play bass, you're going to be learning like these old disco records. And, uh, and it just felt like such a... It was so serendipitous. It was like, wow, this is what I'm studying and this is what I'm finding myself doing vocally too and i learned so much from escort and escort did really well yeah. um and then from there uh on the side i was still doing gigs and gigs and i got a gig to play on um to play based on in the house band of a tv show on nbc called the meredith fiera show oh um, okay yeah. yeah so i was i was in the house band for that show we were taping at 30 rock uh that was in 2013 14 right. 2014 um and uh that's where i met silo and another mm. and that's you know i have to say like really losing something means gaining something new and i've really really got the chance to experience that so much in my life and career wow. um and it's always a good you know sign of hope for anybody who's listening like that was a probably to this day the highest paying gig i ever had and like a dream gig for like obsession musician you know yeah. uh, which I'm not but it was it was great to have that experience and the show only lasted two seasons and uh towards the end we were like oh my god we lost our job like we're not gonna make this money anymore what are we gonna do uh and I just that last week that we had of taping I was like I am leaving this gig with something I am not walking out of 30 Rock with nothing in my pocket no there's no way and CeeLo was the last guest, the very last guest from our tapings. Wow. And he was, you know, again, 
you know, going back when I was 15 years old, I was listening to him in my bedroom and like, when I moved to New York, he, I had a top five of list of people I wanted to work with and he was on it. No. Um, and power of attraction for real. Like he saw me play and he was there with his wife, Shani, who's my friend and I love them so dearly. And he was like, can I ask you something? Like, do, would you want to play bass in, for me? Like, he's like, is this not, is this inappropriate? Because this is your job. You have a job. I was like, actually, I don't have a job anymore. This is where this job ends for me. And we exchanged numbers and I started playing with him like a month later. Shut up. That's, that's, woo. That's right there. Calling that, woo. Manifesting. Oh, man, I love it. You man, yep, you sure did. Man. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh, CeeLo going back to Goody Mob. I, being raised in the South and being a hip hop head. If you didn't know Outkast, the, the Dungeon Family, Goody Mob and CeeLo, then you didn't know hip hop or at least Southern hip hop. So mm-hmm. that, that, that to me is how I go back with, with CeeLo. So I, 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 when I saw that, I was like, oh snap, okay. Let me find out Adeline. But he's mm-hmm. such an eclectic artist. He's just not hip hop. He is, and if you've listened to I'm sure you already know his single stuff because you've performed his music. So oh, how about favorite. that and working with him and going on tour with, with CeeLo? It was, it's, it, I mean, I guess it's in the past because we're not touring at the moment, but. yeah. It's been incredible. And, and I, I would say mainly besides, you know, being able to like cross some, the, you check something off my list, like, wow, this is, and having these weird out of, of almost out of body moments where I'm like on stage behind him and I'm watching him. And I'm like, damn, like I'm remembering this 15 year old girl in a hood who didn't speak English and was like, I want to work with him. And had, I had never touched a bass. I didn't even fucking know anything about bass back in the day. You know what I mean? And then 10 years later, here I am playing for him. And that was amazing. Uh, but may, also I would say like the experience, what I, what, what I took mostly from that experience is, is friends and um, being connected to amazing women that play instruments because he had, he always has a, all, most of the time an all female band and we've created such bonds with the, uh, my, my sisters, you know, and it's important to say like women playing music together, it's never catty there's this bad stigma attached to like all girl bands and stuff. And I mean, listen, if you're a girl and you play the bass or the drums or the horn, like you, you're cool. Like you're not trying to be uh, a caddy with each other. And we're, we're all super tight. And I love, I, I gained sisters. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. I love that. So, uh, so yeah, you're not touring right now for obvious reasons. And uh, so that's still on the table, but let's talk about how, uh, you know, Escort then transitioned into you wanting to put together your first solo album mm-hmm. um, and uh, some of the singles off of that, how that kind of came together and or just like what decide, let's talk about what led to that um, and, and coming up with that. It's another one of these stories. And I think that's how most things have happened in my life where like, I don't know, you punch me and you punch me hard and you, you, you take me down and then I get up and I, it's almost like, you know, you get hit hard and then you see stars. <laughs> Not that I have that much in the face, but thank, yeah. thankfully. Uh, and, but you, you see stars and then like out of this blur moment is when I see clearly what the next thing is for me. Um, and I had been flirting with the idea of being solo and for a while I was starting to produce my own tracks while I was with Escort. I was a little frustrated as a songwriter and producer that I didn't get to really express myself how I wanted I could express myself so much on stage it was my show and my vision but not so much in the studio and it's it's no one's fault. it's just a, a band and the the producer was started it before I I joined even mm-hmm. um but I was I, ju- I was just afraid to step out like and the band was successful and I didn't it was scary to me to just do something on my own and start from zero and it just was really conflicting mm-hmm. uh I was conflicted yeah. But then Prince died. And that was the most, I was, I am the biggest, I mean, Prince is my biggest influence, favorite artist that ever lived and will yeah. ever exist. Yeah. Uh, and he, I was, when he died, I was devastated. It really felt like a family member died. I can feel um, that, yeah. And selfishly, because I had always been convinced deeply, like, me ended up ending up working with CeeLo that I manifested. I, I thought I was going to work with Prince and I had manifested oh. that so much. And yeah, you would have been that was the first time. Yeah, yeah. It was the first time that like, nope, 
that dream is not going to come true. Mm. And I was like, I cannot let that happen ever again. Yeah. And I remember in particular, like watching an interview, Don Lemon, I think, was interviewing Stevie Wonder two days after Prince died. And Stevie was crying and he was like, he asked him, like, what was the most amazing thing about Prince to you? And he was like, he, he said he was fearless. He did not care what people thought about his music. He had, he didn't care. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that was, that, that was the message that I needed. And I just, I was like, that's it. I'm doing my solo stuff. And I just was afraid that my own music wasn't good enough. And I was like, it's okay if it's not good enough. I, I'll make music that makes, that I, I like for myself. Um, and that's how I started working on my first solo album. Love it. So uh, you're working on this solo album. Uh, let's talk about the process of creating it and uh, some of the people that you got uh, behind you uh, that uh, are, you also work with and became writing partners, I know now, uh, mm -hmm. are frequent collaborators. Uh, what was maybe the first track or, or do you have a, uh, or what was the most difficult track to write? And uh, mm -hmm. I think during this time, is this when you met my cuz? And, and, and how no, did falling in love together. come into the picture? You know, how did that? No, no, play? we were already together for like, okay. for probably before like, this yeah way before okay. when actually when i met your cousin and i started dating uh at the time right before i started the tv show okay so gotcha. that was 2013 when we got together and i started working on my solo album in 2016. okay so he he, he saw the whole transition and he really helped me through this transition and interestingly enough i started really officially working on my solo album after we he and i moved together Okay. And I had my I had my own studio in my previous apartment, but I think somehow like starting a new life, starting over, um, living in a new place, building this little home studio really mm -hmm. was kind of like a, another igniting igniting factor. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it was. I, I had some tracks of my own. I started. Some of the songs on, on the album are stuff that I produced from scratch myself. And then uh, I was, you know, knew a lot of collaborators, but I did, there was this guy in particular, Morgan Wiley, who is half Filipino, by the way, hey. <laughs> uh, who I played a few gigs with him. He had a, he had a band called Mainnet Magic, which is the sister band of Escort. Okay. And he is a sick keyboard player. And we did some gigs together with a side project of a friend of ours and just like, you know, it's just an ear thing. And like, he would play some stuff where I was like, <laughs> but you know, I know a lot of sick musicians, but just the choices of sounds. Like he's a, yeah. he's a wizard on the keyboard. He's a highly trained, trained jazz musician, went to the new school and stuff, but like the choice of sounds. And uh, I just hit him up because I was like, oh, and he's really also really cool. And I knew that he's a guy that like, he doesn't have a lot of ego for a musician and he's really chill. And I was like, because I was in this place of super fragile, I was very fragile artistically where yeah. I was trying to still learn the whole Stevie Wonder Prince thing. Like, don't worry about what people think. Yeah, I needed to be in a room with somebody who wasn't gonna judge me. I feel uh, nice. And personality had so much to do with it, his personality mm -hmm. and me just feeling safe, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I hit him up. I was like, I have some tracks and can, can you play keys on some of them? Because I'm a terrible keyboard player. And I was like, uh, so we, he played some keys and then we started a, a track from scratch. And I was like, oh, this is dope, which is actually the first, the opening track on the album. Um, and then we just kept working together and we just ended up making a whole album together. It was just like the situation just worked out. It just worked out. And yeah. Love it. So, so what's your favorite track? I know they're all your baby, but if what is your favorite, or at least favorite track to perform uh, when you were able to perform before COVID hit? Um, you, when oh, you were out there. it's different between what I want to like to like what I am most proud of, like listening to. Okay. It would be Twilight or Mango. Okay. Um, and for the one that I love performing the most, it would be. Uh, for for bass and singing would be emeralds, and then for the wild side, the wild disco <laughs> fake diva side of me would be yeah. when I belong. Okay, what was the most difficult song to to put together that took you a while? Mm. 
Um, a would be uh, what? Uh, oh God, I don't know. I don't know. Let me think. B from the first album, the song before took a minute. Okay. Um, and then from oddly from the new EP, it it was um, stay up. And and why were they? Why did they have issues? We were actually it? talking about that in day. regards to the the the. Was it the sound of it? Was it the words? What, what, what was the most difficult thing you found? And how did you overcome that to inspire others? You know what I'm saying? In regards to other musicians that are listening, what did you do uh, to overcome obstacles as you're writing when you get that writer's block or just something mm -hmm. doesn't hit? How do you overcome that? So had you asked me that three days ago, I would not really know the answer. Okay. But Morgan and I were listening to stuff and we kind of remembered and sort of understood um, the, the, the new EP, a lot of it, and that song in particular, Stay Up, uh, because I got so tight with my band, because there's Morgan in the studio, but there's also Jaleel who plays guitar with us, who's like, a, like my brother, and he, 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 played guitar, he plays guitar and TV on the radio, so he had a really mm -hmm. successful band, and just him playing with us, it's just, you know, I'm so honored. And then Jim Arso on drums, who was with me with Escort, uh, and we played, we toured the world, we played a lot and we got so tight and that's, there was the album, but then there was a tour and the band. And yeah. my sound really was born from playing on stage, yeah. right? And I'm such a performer and I'm, yeah. and because I'm a musician, it's not about just putting tracks together. It's more about like shedding and playing. Um, so after that, that new phase, we decided to bring the band in the studio and I was studying how kind of like D'Angelo and the Roots came up with music and a lot of it are jams. So we, we brought the, studio, the band in the studio and we just jammed for hours and recorded everything and made tracks with it. Yeah. And Stay Up came from, one of the, came from the jam, um, but it was like one of the first grooves we came up with. And I think I've just realized the other day that like that was more challenging to write to because it was it was a jam. It wasn't like yeah. creating a piece of music yeah. necessarily that would um, was thought of as a song. It was just a jam. Yeah. And somehow is and I, maybe it has to do with energies. There are like four people of energies in the room too, and it's different things. But it was it was harder to write for some reason. Interesting. Well, I love it. I love it. Um, but then I'm, I'm sure there's. It, you adapt, but it's also can form creativity. Um, exactly. It wasn't traditional, but then it's another way to explore when you do find yourself in a in a mix. Um, yeah, and it's yeah. more about finding the right balance. You know, different yeah. songs come in different ways. You know, it's just we're not responsible for most of it. It just really is like catching that vibe, catching that. This it's literally like plugging. He's just like. <laughs> plug it and just like you get connected and I'm just a vessel. I don't do shit. <laughs> do. So let me just say that with, so with that being said though, with getting energy from crowds, from performing live. And of course, you know, like we said earlier, we're living in the time of COVID and you can't do that. Um, however, like you said, you, you've, you're, you've always been in the quarantine life because you've always been in the studio. Um, mm -hmm. What are you most looking forward to when we are, when we have a proper vaccine, not, the rush stuff that the this orange guy is trying to put out there. But when we have something real, uh, real, and we can be out there, what are you looking forward to most um, for when you can perform live and uh, uh, and just that creative energy going forward um, collaborations? But let's let's start with just uh, you know performing l live in front of people again and getting that vibe from the audience. I mean, just uh, the the question is the answer. Like, I'm just, I just am looking forward to playing in a venue yeah. on a stage with lights and humans, not into a phone or, yeah. or a laptop. I just, I cannot wait for that to happen. Yeah. I cannot, I mean, yeah. Well, I'll say for the people that have been seeing you virtually, because I have tuned in, you know, family support family, we've tuned into some of those virtual concerts. It, it's, it's just good to hear you. It takes our mind off of what is occurring. So for those artists like yourself, uh, to help us with the doom and gloom. Thank you mm -hmm. for performing. Even though you don't have that immediate reaction, you're helping ease the stress of what's occurring right now. No, it's, um, it's very difficult because, and it, the situation, as much as it's worked out for me, um, timing wise, because the quarantine started, I was 
I had an EP done that I was planning on releasing. We stuck with the we stuck with the plan, and that worked out because that was a good time for people to listen to new music uh, because expectations were lowered in terms of what people were coming up with. Um, being an independent artist, I just ended up making three videos in my living room because just F it and yeah. that worked out. You know, in normal times, I would not have done that. It would have been, I would have been too embarrassed and afraid, but people's vision and perception and expectations changed. So that worked out for my, in my favor. What, what I feel didn't work out as well for me is, and what's difficult is not only, you know, selfishly i need the stage like it's yeah, like a, it's like breathing yeah but it's also i trained years to get to a certain level and to you know i sell myself and connect with people i need to be standing on a stage with my bass and with my band yeah and i have to sell my new music at, with something that i don't excel at or didn't even work on which is sitting down and playing the guitar. And that's not my forte at all. It's so hard. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, you're good at basketball, but you got to play baseball. Like it's, you know. I can imagine, yeah. Well, So well, that's you. the one thing where, so I appreciate, you know, when people say that watching it, they, they got something from it because I, I just, I feel apologetic. I'm always telling people, I'm so sorry. I'm not showing you the best strongest side of my artistry i just wish i could give you more and this is like not what i do best well the real ones know the real ones know and i hope I, I know you're ready to give it i know you're ready to give it because that's just who you are and and that's what's so amazing about you um so let's talk about um the future and collaborations uh, one of the biggest recent collaborations you've had um and again it's a banger that i just the vibe is so there uh, you did a collaboration with Kamau and it's reached, where, where are we on views now? Almost 3 million. It's like 2 million now uh, for Mango. And uh, being a Filipino, I love some, some mangoes and to have a song called Mango and just the vibe of Mango, man, it's lit. How did that come together? And can we get more of those collaborations with you and Kamau? Is it Kamau, Kamau? I'm not sure if I said it right. And what no, other yeah, collaborations do you have coming up soon? Well, um, Thank you. First of all, I'm so glad you like that song. And uh, you know, the, the one thing I would like to say, the lesson here is the humility of Kamal and his open-mindedness to collaborating with me was such a, I commend him and I have so much respect for him because it's not to throw shades and I, I'm not going to give names. A lot of people turn me down and my numbers, where they are, because a lot of people look by the numbers, and that's okay. We all do it. The way my where my numbers are now and where they were last year, totally different spectrums. And Kamal didn't care. He he hit me up, and he was like, "We knew each other through my husband and and everyday people and that whole family." And he was like, "Let's collaborate and let's do something." And he came to the studio, and it was again one of those we. We plugged it and we were, it just happened. That song happened. He did an interview and the way he described it for Lady Gone, the way he describes it is true. He's like, I walked in, we had a track, which was just bass and drums. And when he walked in, Morgan was putting down some keys. I was like, oh, let's put down some keys on that one. He might like that track. He started freestyling. We wrote the song in four hours. And in the, in the span of these four hours, Carter, who's the Carter Gasutake who played um, horn trumpet on the song who's Morgan's best friend was next door playing trumpet for someone else another Ben and while I was like hey, I'm just saying guys hi I'm like Carter get in the booth record a solo for this song we got this track so Carter goes in there he's like okay like he starts recording and then at seven o'clock the song was done it was done and I play I did I did um I always do that. I mean, that was my first time actually doing that with my closest friends that I pick, like uh, musicians, not musicians, creatives and blah, 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 that I sat them in a room a few months later to listen to all the new music and people lost their minds when they heard Mango. And I was like, oh, wow, this is probably a hit. Like, I think we got something. Um, so anyways, Kamal just, he just didn't care about, you know, he's signed to a major label, I'm not. 
um, his, his label could have been like, no, and they somehow they were okay with it. And I produced a song, Morgan and I are called Nightshade as producers. Uh, and now Nightshade is producing tracks for other artists. We're hopefully working on Kamal for some of his, his own material. And so the collaboration aspect to answer your question is the, the number one, I mean, the new thing is focusing on producing other artists. You know, it's a little bit like, Pharrell and Chad. There we go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so so we have Nightshade. And as Nightshade, we want to produce more artists, uh, send some tracks and produce for other people. And um, working on my um, next EP that I think will probably come out in the first quarter next year. And I, I have a lot of artists I'd love to collaborate with. Yeah, for awesome. sure. Well, I can't wait for it. And when we get closer to that, I'd love to bring you back on and talk about that and push that but like I, I think a testament to this whole interview and, and for any artists that are out there is just always evolving um still yeah. pursue that dream but you evolve to make the dream a reality and uh i think that relationship with kamal was amazing and uh and just what you're doing as well but like you said it's all a numbers game with with the industry the entertainment industry and making things happen but you are a star and it's gonna happen and i just love what you're doing and how it's all coming along um, Adeline, man, fam, yo, this has been a pleasure. Um, anything else you want to highlight that we have coming up soon, uh, outside of the album when it, when it's ready? So how, how far along are you on this new uh, album? So because I'm a studio rap, <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah. always at, a, at the studio. So yeah. I have more than enough songs for a next EP, but okay. I just want to really like put intention into what sonically the direction is it's not going to be very different from the previous ep okay. um but really like pick the best songs yeah um and yeah there will there are some really exciting things coming up but i can't talk about them yet all right maybe you and i can get offline not to the world yeah, yet. <laughs> I, I for sure tell you offline yeah yes well uh why don't we throw them socials as you say it i'm gonna have it pop up on the screen how they can follow you uh, on IG, Twitter, wherever you may be, or just the website. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let, let's do that real quick. Uh, so it's Adeline, A-D-E-L-I-N-E. -E, and uh, so that's the handle for Instagram at Adeline. Uh, very important, follow me on Spotify also. I don't think people know the importance of that, but especially for indie artists to keep in touch with uh, our audience. And that way you guys get a notification when I release a track or something. Um, so follow me on Spotify and uh, my YouTube channel is also Adeline. So Love just it. check out the new video Mango and, and follow me on everything. <laughs> excellent, excellent. This has been an immense pleasure because you're fam, not, and, and you're an artist as well, but I just love, I love you so much and I wanna see you succeed. And I hope we've got some new fans uh, watching now. Uh, that are down with us. Actually, you know what? There's one thing I'm not going to let you off the hook yet, because we are okay. the nerds. Because we are the nerds of color. Um, I've been starting to do nerd checks, and I know you got a little bit of nerd in you. Okay. What is the nerd thing? What would what would you be? What would you classify yourself a nerd over? Whether it be you know, it could be just playing chess, or could it be comic books? Could it be game? What what whatever? What do you nerd about? What can somebody not? What can my cousin D not challenge you on? Is it music? Like. Sonically, like you can name you, you're, you're such a nerd over music that you can name every artist from this or that. You know what I'm saying? It's easy. What, what are you nerd about? It's 90s, early 2000 RB. I will win a quiz. I know the lyrics, I know all the bands. I mean, SWV, Tony Braxton, that time, okay. I am um, that, that's my spot. Okay, let's have a contest. <laughs> so, like, if I was like portrait, uh, silk, uh, high five. Like uh, those, some of those classic R and B cats, uh, Jodeci. You know all them cats. You, you could probably give me track from every one of them. My my er, my is a little bit later, like the early. Oh, that's true. Stuff. I am an old head. I am an old head. So <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. It's good. We could be a team, and then you would cover the nineties, and I would cover the early two thousands. There, there we go. go. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. I love you. I hope you stay safe. Yeah. And uh, send all my love to the fam. And I am Kuya P. You are watching the Nerds of Color. Thank you for joining us for another knock exclusive interview with my homie, the amazing, the talented, the beautiful Miss Adeline. All right.
Thank you. Thank you.